Okay, so um, hi everyone. Um, it's it's really a pleasure uh, to welcome and introduce Dan Danielson. Um, Dan is professor of law at Northeastern University School of Law in Boston. Um, and I'm not going to try to summarize uh, his research here. Dan is an incredibly creative uh, and generous thinker and teacher. And he has spent uh, a lot of time exploring and writing about uh, law and inequalities, uh, the place of corporations and corporate power in complex transnational, social, political, and economic context, and about their distributive effects, uh, bridging different legal disciplines and, and non-legal disciplines. And today he will uh, talk about the distributive effects uh, of trade within what he and others have called the supply chain capitalism. Um, and he will talk about uh, some of his um, recent projects, uh, looking at um, how uh, we can start to reimagine development in a more uh, sustainable and equitable way. Thank you. Dan for joining us. Um, Dan will speak for about 25-30 uh, minutes and then we will open the floor for questions uh, and, um, and, and a conversation with Dan. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you Ivana and Alicia for um, making this possible and thank you all for um, coming and sharing your afternoon with me. Um, Ivana asked me to uh, to sort of talk across a range of different um, topics, partly describing some specific work, partly talking about how that work is um, implicated in, in pedagogic things that I've been trying, and some new, uh, to talk about some new, uh, more recent um, thinking about uh, reimagining development outside of, uh, or not outside of, but in relationship to um, market capitalism. So, um, so the paper, well, the paper that I shared with you was actually um, an interesting sort of turning point for me. I've been I've been teaching law and economic development as a course for over fifteen years, and um, I had found myself growing increasingly skeptical and um, losing, in a certain sense, losing faith in um, the developmentalist paradigm as a paradigm that could deliver for the world. And um, more specifically in this particular piece, I had to confront what were, what turned out to be growing disagreements with many friends who were working in um, and thinking about uh, progressive ideas related to um, trade and distribution from the perspective of international economic law. And so I was asked to contribute to this volume and the piece that I shared with you was a, was a chapter, um, but it was a little bit, it was definitely written against the grain of the general tenor of the book. And so it, it, it posed complicated social questions, but it also really um, challenged my own thinking in terms of what I understood with a focus on um, the parts of the developing world, which I see as most, um, that weren't actually seeing the benefits of globalization under neoliberalism. Uh, and so in this piece, which I know some of you may have read, but I'll just I'll just share a quick quick summary of the of what I was trying to do. Um, I basically start it's, it makes three real points. Uh, the first point is, in some ways, uh, developmentalism and trade liberalization uh, during the neoliberal period from the 80s through the WTO, through um, bilateral investment treaties, through uh, the proliferation 
of uh, free trade agreements and, uh, and so forth was in some ways incredibly successful in, uh, in successful in the sense of bringing developing economies into a global system. Um, it also pr produced a really dramatic um, realignment of the global organization of production. It, uh, the elimination or reduction of most trade barriers, at least um, ones that were uh, impacting the possibility of um, widely distributed um, repro uh, production with folks uh, bringing in puts in, adding min minuscule amounts of value, shipping them to another place, um, were, uh, were essentially um, creating a whole new global order. And the global order, I, I didn't coin the phrase, but um, I described as supply chain capitalism, which was essentially an order in which um, production moved from the uh, vertically integrated transnational corporation structure, which was largely organized around branch manufacturing in developing countries for the purpose of selling in that geographic location or region to uh, a kind of denationalized, de, um, the territorialized and widely distributed uh, network form of production, which was organized mainly through contract rather than ownership and, uh, and, uh, and meant in effect, produced a situation in which um, we see a dramatic increase in uh, develop, developed country exports as a percentage of global manufacturers. So what did happen was there was a shift um, to, a, to a pretty substantial extent from you know, primary product and raw material exports from developing countries to manufactured exports. However, we also saw some very limited growth in most of the world, lots of, um, lots of uh, or no um, impact on, on poverty reduction, increases in inequality and and so forth. So um, but the first argument is uh, that the trade regime was very uh, significant in bringing this about. Um, but uh, I thought that um, progressive thinking around uh, trade and development was sort of missing um, significantly missing this transformation and therefore very unlikely to have much impact. And um, so the argument that I made was essentially that the more disaggregated and more dis distributed production became, um, the less it was attached to any particular jurisdiction and the more that um, was the case. Uh, it was harder and harder for individual um, states to organize their um, their relationship to global economy through industrial policy of the traditional type, or through um, through um, using using tariffs and so forth. It wound up being a situation in which the the, the institutions in the global system that had the strongest interest in the coordination of these global supply chains were lead firms. And um, lead firms were essentially exercising enormous amounts of control over the global system through their ordinary business practices. So um, through supply contracts, through corporate codes of conduct, through um, just-in-time manufacturing, uh, um, supply chain management software that, uh, that um, limited uh, tech transfer, all sorts of things were um, were shaping uh, were shaping the global system. At the same time, the incredible success of bringing uh, developing countries into early stage, low tech, um, low uh, 
uh, labor intensive manufacturing meant that there was cutthroat competition between suppliers um, trying to get access to the global chains. And so the combination of um, the only game in town is uh, participation in global supply chains. Participation in global supply chains is incre incredibly competitive. It moves the country from a focus on forward and backward linkages and economic development inside the nation to um, relationships that may put domestic firms in deep competition with each other in ways that um, made it difficult to, uh, to manage one single industrial policy. And on top of that, the fact that um, developing countries trying to, uh, trying to um, diversify their economies were in a situation where uh, they were trying to enter into and compete in a range of different supply chains, which were demanding different levels of um, worker safety and, and so forth as a condition to um, participation in the supply chain. So um, a multinational corporation it is usually the focus of, um, of IRE, but sometimes they were producing higher standards than the nation required, whereas other, uh, other potential uh, uh, buyer firms, oh goodness, it's the bane of the neighborhood, the leaf blower, um, hopefully you can hear me. Um, so, uh, at, it was producing a situation in which, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought, one second. It produced a situation where um, the supply, the, the individual firm and the nation state were both trying to orient themselves to how they could best continue to participate in these um, global supply chains, which meant that their, their regulatory practices were going to adjust to the demands of the lead firms rather than, and also their expectations about competing supplier countries. So if you think I'm gonna to try to raise labor standards in my state, but actually all the other people supply me apparel chains are not, then in effect, you might be producing more hardship in your domestic economy by raising labor standards than the absence of labor standards could produce. So um, the, the second piece was essentially that um, supply chain capitalism was limiting the bargaining power and innovative capacity of many um, developing countries and development country firms in trying to capture equitable shares of the rents in, uh, from participation in global trade. So the last piece uh, is, is really focusing on how, um, given these conditions, the, uh, the sort of traditional progressive approaches from the trade and development perspective to, um, to making things better for developing countries we're missing significant, um, we're missing the boat in a sense. And um, the first one that I would call the sort of standard progressive approach is essentially to say, the trade rules have become too restrictive. They're more, what we need to do is create more policy space for developing countries to be able to um, engage in the kinds of industrial policy and uh, import substitution, industrialization and so forth that was so crucial to the development of the North Atlantic countries. And, um, and so the problem is that. A second one is, um, no, the problem isn't that the trade rules are too strict. The problem is the lack of capacity in developing countries to make strategic and effective use of the trade rules. And so what we really need to do is engage in capacity building. And the third sort of progressive, uh, the sort of, I would say mainstream progressive um, conception was not necessarily to focus on the trade rules, but rather to focus on national development policy and the creation and management of innovation to enable domestic firms to more effectively participate and upgrade in the global chains. Um, and 
My argument is that, or I argued in this piece anyway, that um, each of these things may lead to some increased growth in some places, but um, by and large, um, the rules that were making, uh, creating these competitive conditions and creating and empowering lead firms were not primarily trade rules anymore. They were primarily um, rules of uh, contract and, uh, and tax and intellectual property and, um, and so forth. And that the, um, and in order to engage with these, uh, these issues, um, you really needed to get at what was what were the enabling conditions that were producing these inequitable distributions globally. And my argument was that that required a much more sophisticated understanding of global supply structures and the legal mechanisms that were contributing to their, uh, to their um, power. And um, so essentially uh, from there, I started to think, okay, um, we need a new we need a new approach. We need to look beyond the trade rules to to more. I think, for example, and I, I sort of in a kind of provocative um, maybe overstatement said, look, if that WTO loosened up policy space tomorrow and and gave a bunch of capacity to work with the trade regime. Um, through money or training or whatever to developing countries, it's very likely to have almost no impact on um, the things that are actually constraining them, which is these competitive conditions between co-supplier countries and uh, lead firm uh, power exercised through supply structures. So um, the next thing I'm gonna share with you was an attempt to kind of reflect on uh, okay, if that if if that process is uh, is accurate, my description of the of the constraints and the difficulties are accurate, and um, and then we need to work on a method for doing this work more effectively. And so um, I've come up with uh, this piece is published yet. It's but it is a kind of five heuristics that are ways of changing your thinking. They're aimed at studying supply chains, but I think they could be um, understood to be understanding, trying to understand global political economy more broadly, at least in relationship to, um, to uh, private economic actors. Sorry. Okay, so um, so here here goes on the heuristics. Um, the first is to focus on the legal regimes through which corporate actors exercise power, rather than the law that purports to govern that exercise. So, at the core of this is a shift from uh, public law, in a certain sense, whether domestic or international to private law regimes like contract, tort, property, corporate, tax, employment law, intellectual property, um, as well as private ordering regimes and business practices like corporate codes of conduct and accountability mechanisms, multi-source supply structures, industry standards and certification schemes, um, strate strategies for risk shifting, inventory management systems, and so forth. So it was going to require getting much more in the weeds um, about the, the range of legal regimes that were coming together to contribute to um, a particular uh, to a particular concentration of power in the firms that might enable um, uh, new um, strategies for engaging in redistributive politics. Um, the second one was um, was a little bit of a challenge for most lawyers, but and it it's a challenge also I think to um, a business and human rights approach. Although I'm not averse to a business and human rights approach, but this this is sort of a a kind of if you will uh, 
gentle critique from the left of business and human rights. So you look beyond rights violations and legal redress. We're usually as lawyers focusing on where's the harm and how do we fix it? And focus us on, on the, the place, the site, which seems like the place of impact. In, in supply chain studies, it's usually at the end of the chain. So, and this isn't to, um, to, to decenter um, the most vulnerable, but rather to look at the regimes that provide the enabling conditions for the unjust allocations of power and wealth, rather than um, thinking about how do we fix um, what we see as the end harm? And um, so it's really to turn one's attention to these map mapping these legal regimes that are enabling injustice. And what that is in a, in a certain sense is really to try to bring into focus um, the complex infrastructure, the complex legal infrastructure that's holding up the unjust regime. Um, and then uh, the next thing would be uh, with clear seeing, hopefully you would have a better, uh, a better uh, handle on where and how to intervene. And um, so in a sense, um, this is a sort of argument that the violation, the human rights violation at the end of the chain is a, an effect of the disease, but it's not the disease itself and we need to actually diagnose the disease. Um, third thing is, um, the third slogan is, place the particular conditions that you're looking at in the chain um, into the global political economy of GBC capitalism. So what you're doing first is trying to drill down into the specificities of a particular configuration of, uh, of and distribution of rents, vulnerability, power, uh, value inside of a particular chain, and then, in, and then not stopping there, but trying to then step back and situate that chain in a broader global system that would help you to see connections between um, uh, similar conditions in different chains. So, um, so this would, in effect, um, make it possible to contextualize the injustices in, in, in broader patterns of extraction, competition, interdependence that can reveal obstacles as well as opportunities for um, potential uh, sites of um, collaboration or solidarity which wouldn't necessarily be obvious if you're only looking inside of the single structure. And to a certain extent, the trade distribution and development paper was trying to do that. It was trying to step back from, uh, from the concrete and situate some of these broader uh, themes. And I, I did it also in another, another piece called um, Situating Human Rights uh, approaches to corporate accountability in the political economy of supply chain capitalism, which tried to talk a little bit about why a lot of multi-stakeholder initiatives and um, were feeling disappointed about the results that were coming from the efforts. And not that they weren't making real material differences on the ground, but that they didn't feel like they were having an impact on the structure. And so I thought, okay, well, what we need to do is realize that what you're fighting against is not just the palm growers in this particular place. It's this whole entire structure, which is empowering, uh, empowering others to the disadvantage of the workers and the palm growers and all the other people, right? So um, the fourth slogan is uh, looking for possibilities for partially overlapping interests rather than conflicting ones among actors within a chain and between competing chains. And what this is really about is um, trying to work. So we're in a radically asymmetrical situation. The, the, the power distribution in a supply chain is radically asymmetrical. So um, that can feel initially totally dis dis disabling or, um, or disheartening. Um, but what I'm trying to suggest is if you can situate these conditions into broader structures of supply chain capitalism, then you're in a position potentially to see that 
it's not it's not just a labor capital structure at the uh, uh, struggle at the end of the chain. Maybe both labor and capital in the of suppliers are being squeezed by intermediaries or by lead firms in way that in ways that could um, open up the possibility for solidarity or at least partially overlapping interests to lead them to work together. Or another possibility would be competing supplier uh, countries um, getting together and saying, okay, we know everyone can move. It's impossible for us to do what we want to do uh, to make things better in the country, because if we do it and nobody else does it, we're going to be slammed. Um, and so what we need to do is set a floor. And even though supplier countries are competing for those things, it may be that they could extract more of the rents if they, you know, so this is just a general sort of labor organizing idea, but across nations. But the basic idea is that those kinds of possibilities of overlapping, even partially overlapping interests in an asymmetrical structure um, can, um, can, uh, can help to create new strategies for social movement inside the structures. And the last one is um, uh, better maps for legal drivers of unjust allocations and UECs can lead to better redistributive politics. And this is essentially um, thinking about ways in which um, despite the radical asymmetries inside of supply structures, what we've seen um, in the pandemic and the post-pandemic efforts, the post if you want, the, the, the continuing efforts of global supply structures to deal with um, tiny disruptions in various places in the chain is the extent to which these chains are incredible systems of interdependence. Even if you're weak, you're needed at every level in the chain. Every single person in the chain is needed, right? So then the question is, how do you use that limited power, maybe through aligning with people with overlapping interests to, um, act, to uh, use the global chain structure as a mechanism for redistributive politics? And, and part of this is, um, it, I think it's not completely crazy to think about this because, um, because it's very hard, and this is where I'm gonna go next, it's very hard to, um, to see nation states, even big developed nation states doing much about this um, in, the, in their individual, even we're seeing some of this um, supply chain disclosure stuff, we're seeing, we're seeing efforts to try and um, exercise some control, but the but it's super it's super limited in terms of its um, its aspirations. It still seems to be very much a product of uh, you know reticence, a, a residual neoliberal res reticence for the state to assert uh, control over aspects of the economy in any significant way, and. Um, and, and most of these structures are actually transnational and touch many, many, many countries. So I once had a, I once actually had a little poster, which I subsequently lost, of a, um, of a HP bubble jet printer that cost under $100 that had inputs from 156 countries. And so you can sort of see that um, in those circumstances, uh, these are already existing transnational structures of interdependence um, that are governing in the global system through, uh, through their negotiation processes. And if we could intervene in those in, in ways, organize social movement inside of those, you could get transnational effects that would be difficult for any individual state to produce. So that was just that, that's that piece. And then um, from this kind of sort of thinking about mapping uh, and, and methodologies for mapping, I had the opportunity to um, co-teach with a close collaborator, friend, colleague, um, Lucy White um, from Harvard, uh, who 
mainly focuses on um, development in Africa, but also on social welfare and social movements. And we decided to try and see whether this mapping methodology um, that we were applying to these global horizontal um, chains could actually also be useful in thinking about discrete situated instances of inequality in particular places. And so um, we took on, we, 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 in, our, in this little workshop, we, we, uh, we did a, a case study on the Rana Plaza disaster, um, which was a big factory collapse um, in Bangladesh that killed 1,100 people and wounded many, many more. And um, we tried to situate that not as an accident, but as, as a sort of expected uh, externality of, of, of the structure by building out what were the legal conditions that were producing this particular form of exploitation and the pressures on um, suppliers. Um, and, and at the same time, we did uh, an analysis of um, Ferguson, Missouri, uh, where Michael Brown was shot and started the um, Black Lives Matter movement emerged out of that. And what we did was, uh, with the help of a really wonderful article, which I teach all the time and you might look for by um, Walter Johnson. He's a historian of slavery, but he grew up in St. Louis and he wrote an article in the Atlantic um, about why Ferguson, Missouri, which is the headquarters of three Fortune 500 companies, is getting 30% of its revenues from fines um, on people of color. And so it, it, was, a, um, it was a really interesting uh, effort to try and unpack housing law and, uh, and different phases of development strategy and um, real estate zoning, all sorts of aspects that were contributing and had been contributing through time to a particular distribution and racialization of vulnerability in this place. And um, so after that experiment, I, uh, I thought, yeah, there's something here. And also this is something I think my students need to know how to do. And so I developed a course called Law and Inequality, which is mainly aimed at um, uh, essentially what, what I do is I try to give students uh, some background uh, understanding of this basic methodology, um, both of mapping and of analyzing the distributional consequences of, of aspects of the, of, the, of the map. And then um, they, they self-organize into groups. They focus on specific instances of inequality that they care about. And, uh, and the course, to, over the course, they develop their own con rich contextualized inequality, inequality maps, um, legal inequality maps that sort of situate their problem in a broader context. So for example, um, I had some students that were really interested in, uh, in bail reform and trying to uh, and, and trying to address the hardships that bail produced for um, not only the people who were going to be incarcerated or but also their families and um, and that generally is approached as a criminal justice problem and it's had a really hard time getting any traction in legislatures so what they tried to do is build out a bigger map and what they eventually did was uh, was um, realize uh, that the bail contracts were were um, would fit into traditional into pretty traditional um, conceptions of unconscionable contracts um, and uh, and and or violate a lot of consumer protection rules and so then they started thinking about ways that um, you could bring uh, you could start to think about um, and make more visible the um, inequalities that were built into the bail system. Uh, in ways and then engage them in ways that might feel 
uh, or might be more political palatable in the United States as a consumer protection problem, as an unfairness problem, as an overreaching problem, rather than as a criminal justice problem. So that's just a way of imagining how it's essentially a, a strategy for trying to help students to engage with problems by, um, by um, not going at them with this is wrong and this is what I have to fix, but going at them with how do I get a better handle on what's, what are all the things contributing to the situation legally and then and culturally and historically. And so what I do in the course then is in the first, after they get a, their methodology, they figure out what their project is, they all present their, um, their projects to each other in an abstract form. And then I teach them different ways of opening up their, um, their, uh, their problem to new ways of thinking. And just to give you a couple of examples of that, I, I, do, uh, I do a thing on scale, population, and geography. You know, if you shrink the problem, if you expand the problem, how does the problem get a whole different valence? And that's, um, I talk to them about, uh, about uh, time and history. You know, if you're focusing on the immediate situation, you would get a very different potential perspective on what's going on than if you shifted into a bigger register or vice versa. And um, I try to help them think about system and structure, and I do that with a focus on race uh, and racialization, but it's a it's essentially trying to, how do you deal with something that feels so pervasive that it's everywhere and yet you can't quite get your hands on it anywhere. And, um, and, and we do these, on, do another one on binaries, conceptual binaries, how they, how they help and how, how they can be constraining. And then something about alternative imaginaries, you know, sort of, um, and all of this is, so what we do is I give them these theoretical readings, but then they talk about them in relationship to projects and they use that as a way of developing their inequality maps. So that's one way in which pedagogically I've taken some of these ideas and tried to build them into teaching. And, I, and, um, and uh, Ivana had said that you guys have been having conversations about pedagogy and thinking about how to do this stuff. Um, and so the last thing I'm gonna to say to you uh, is uh, something about, and I know I'm talking too long, but I'm gonna just do this quickly. The last thing I'm gonna to say to you is something about my uh, a current project that I have um, with a range of collaborators. Um, it's an interdisciplinary group. And essentially I think they're, um, they're, we're focused on a lot of the issues that, um, that sigil seems to be focused on, uh, and um, and we we sort of felt in in even in ourselves that part of our challenge was we just our our imagination was somehow constrained, but we didn't even know what boxes we were in. You know, we couldn't to even begin to think about what would be different. And so, um, so what we did was we we first focused on trying to describe some what we call disturbing trends. And I think all of these would be um, would be ones that you would recognize, although you might not agree exactly with the characterization. So one is uh, contemporary patterns of production, distribution, consumption, economic development, social hierarchy, systematic subordination, and environmental extraction pose dire risks for the welfare and survival of the planet. So it's now um, a little bit moving out of a developmentalist paradigm into a paradigm of of you know climate crisis, contemporary political practices and legal administrative institutions of government, whether it's local, state, national, or transnational levels, seem both ill-suited and unlikely to generate meaningful interventions to ameliorate or may even exacerbate processes of planetary decline. So we're it's a it's a, a an anxiety about the effectiveness of of current institutions. Third, innovation, experimentation, adaptation, resistance, transformation. They see most eyes from social needs organizations and institutions or movements that may or may not coincide with extant political uh, or jurisdictional configurations. So things are, you know, and if you see the way that um, climate justice is working, or you see the way that Black Lives Matter is working, it's it's 
it's not confined to Ferguson or to the United States. It's, it's expanding in all sorts of complicated ways to other communities, to other, uh, other constituencies. And so in these circumstances, it seems like government's probably going to follow, support, resist, but seem unlikely to lead for the better. So, um, so in a certain sense, these experiments seem like the hope. Um, on the other hand, disparate existing and emerging experiments in new modes of collective coexistence, livelihood, ways of being, while they're both important and necessary, they seem unlikely to be sufficient to offset the systemic threats facing the nations and the planet. So the idea is essentially, and I think if you read the kind of design literature or the alternative imaginaries or prefigurative pre literatures, um, a lot of, uh, to the extent they're optimistic, they often sort of imagine that these experiments are somehow going to self-congeal into something that would produce some kind of systemic um, transformation. So um, what we decided in this group was to, to work with a concept that we thought was maybe productive, potentially productive, which is the idea of the region. Um, and this is a, it's, so it's not, it's not region as a, as a specific thing, and I'll explain why, um, what, how we're using it a, a little bit. So regions can sing, signal a conceptual alternative to extant geographic, political, and jurisdictional boundaries by transversing, transgressing, or reconfiguring boundaries, often with particular objectives, um, like ethnic, ideological, or effective affiliation, or trying to create some kind of infrastructure that's going to cross, uh, cross between um, boundaries. Regions are necessarily plural in a sense. One is rarely tied to only one region. Um, and regions in that sense are non-exclusive in that beings, non-beings, and geographies can inhabit multiple regional configurations and affiliations. So it's an attempt to try and imagine fluid, a fluid kind of, um, of, of, of political and, and uh, collective. Um, space of possibility. Regions aren't anchored in any scale. They might be smaller than a political unit. It could be like an economic empowerment zone in a, in a city, or they might um, comprise multiple units, um, like a linguistic group or uh, the EU, or um, they might be communities with shared interests that are affiliated through social media, or they could be, uh, brought together because they're all being afflicted by uh, you know, floating clouds of smog. I mean, the way in which these configurations can happen would be um, quite fluid and quite provisional. Um, thus, the concept of the region seems appealing from the standpoint of deterritorialized conceptions of connectedness. So interdependence and affinity, as well as spatial attachment. Um, and so, these potentials are as fluid as the concept of region, and, and that has, we found, been productive in terms of trying to imagine um, what kind, if we're trying to um, reimagine development, if we're trying to reimagine uh, engaging in, um, in experimentation about reimagining livelihoods, how, how do you constitute the communities that produce these, um, these things? But uh, another key issue is, and this relates back to this underlying idea about trade, even as they seem fluid, regions, regions are, um, they're implicitly, uh, if only provisionally bounded. So a region can't consume the whole. So in a certain sense, we're, we're talking about lots of um, ways of engaging and interconnecting. Um, so we've, uh, one, well, I'll say what, just two more things. Um, normative, normatively, um, we have some kind of baseline ideas. These are super baseline ideas about, um, what we're trying to accomplish and then some themes that we need to focus on as a matter of um, how to bring it about. So the normative aspirations involve um, 
one, systems of provision, distribution, participation, care, and well-being shouldn't be premised solely or conditioned solely on market or quid pro quo, get up exchange, or charity. So one idea is inclusion based on simple being should give rise to an entitlement to a say in collective governance and a share of the collective product. Um, membership, participation, entitlement of individuals and groups and social organizations, communities, qualities, and networks should be multiple, porous, and non-exclusive and not based on necessarily on territory or property. Um, emergent experiments and new configurations of governance um, will require sufficient autonomy to enable these processes of self-organization to emerge. So they need some room to be left alone. And on the other hand, no organization, community, polity, or network can meet all its needs on its own. Coexistence, survival, and well being for all is going to require interaction, collaboration, and sharing with others. So, then how do we tackle these things um, in a more concrete way? And I'm just going to suggest four, four quick things. One is you can, and this builds out of the mapping exercises what are the motivating conditions? Um, what drivers are going to generate the energy for the experimentation, adaptation, resistance? So how do we how do we start to think about what is necessary? Are those material conditions, political will, can critique contribute, um, institution failure, ne necropolitics? Do we need new subjectivities? How are we going to get um, mo get people mobilizing? Um, Enabling conditions and infrastructures. What legal, material, institutional, and other infrastructures are creating current patterns of obstacles, and and what poss and and also possibilities. And what would we need in in terms of legal, material, institutional, or other infrastructures to enable and support these alternative configurations? So how would we start to create um, new institutional infrastructure that would make possible um, these uh, experiments to get off the ground. Interface mechanisms are assuming that the order is a plural order of interdependence, what legal and other modes of interface will be needed to enable and sustain coexistence, manage conflict, facilitate sharing, mediate clashes of values. If you're trying to imagine something that is politically and democratically um, self-constituted, then you can't, we have to imagine that lots of the value systems are not necessarily going to um, smoothly interact with each other. And so this would be um, building on the idea of finding partially overlapping interests. How do you create mechanisms for interconnection and sharing, even if without having one set of, of dominant shared values um, or dominant shared governance? Or, or organizational structures. And the last one is coordination mechanisms. What legal technology, technological or other mechanisms will be needed to facilitate cooperation, mutually beneficial and equitable exchange, rules of engagement and conflict resolution amongst. Um, so, you know, in a certain sense, it's if we're gonna imagine new possibilities, we have to imagine new legal institutions to um, both give them the space to emerge and also um, um, give them the possibilities for uh, not being immediately crushed or not resorting to, um, to uh, violence uh, or, um, or other modes um, that have so afflicted <laughs> human history um, to date. So I know that was a ton um, and I know I, sh I probably should have talked less, but I was trying to give you the full um, range of what Ivana asked me to touch on. So um, uh, whatever you want to talk about is completely fine. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Dan, for uh, this was this was really fabulous. Um,